When we talk about damping of a system in structural mechanics, we will find there are typically several mechanisms that work in tandem to dissipate energy and hence dampen the vibration or motion of a system. For instance, in an automobile suspension, there are several mechanisms that can dissipate energy, from the suspension, to the brakes, to the tires. The shock absorbers, which most of us are likely familiar with, help improve the comfort and handling of the ride by limiting the motion of the car when excited by a bumpy road or even isolating this type of vibration. The brakes dissipate energy through frictional damping as the brake pad squeezes on the rotors. And even the tires can dissipate energy and dampen the vibrations as they deform. The rate of dissipation or damping depends on several factors, such as the operating speed, the materials, and even the frequency of the vibration can affect how well the material will dampen the vibration. Now damping as a physical phenomenon is quite complex and it may not always be well understood the actual mechanisms at play. But numerically in a simulation, its implementation is rather quite simple. Let's look at some common types of damping, keeping in mind that the overall damping of a system in say a car, a building, an airplane, etc., will often be comprised of a combination of one or more actual physical damping phenomena. Viscous damping is a very common type of damping and it relies on the viscous heat dissipation by a fluid. And an automobile shock absorber is a common example of a viscous damper. So how does the shock absorber dampen? The shock absorber is filled with a fluid like an oil, and there's a piston that moves through the fluid. Now the piston has small openings or orifices that regulate the flow of the fluid. The fluid passes through these orifices between the chambers of fluid resulting in frictional energy losses in the fluid, effectively removing energy through typically heat. Now the damping force is proportional to the velocity of the damper, so fast motions resist greater than slow motions. We specify C or the C matrix to account for this type of damping. Another example of viscous damping would be a loudspeaker, where external fluid such as air provides viscous damping to the cone of a loudspeaker. The large face of the cone is moving in and out at varying frequencies and is interacting directly with the air affecting the vibration characteristics. Designing a loudspeaker, one needs to understand the effects of this interaction. The next type of physical damping we'll discuss is material damping. Material damping is also known as solid, structural, or hysteretic damping. Material damping arises from complex molecular interactions within a material. And what happens at the material level is not our focus, but we can think of the mechanism as a type of internal frictional loss, which will often be dissipated as heat. As the material deforms, energy is lost. If we plot the cyclic stress strain response, otherwise known as the hysteresis plot of a typical steel material from an experiment, where we pull and push on the material, we will see an area enclosed by these curves. This area represents the energy dissipated during the deformation of the material. This type of damping, this material damping, is typically independent of the frequency of the excitation. But the damping is typically proportional to the displacement, as one would gather from this graph. Now in some materials, such as viscoelastic materials, the damping is frequency dependent, and we will discuss this shortly. Rubber vibration isolator pads are a good example of this type of material damping, as the rubber absorbs the kinetic energy from the vibration and stores it as internal energy and dissipates that heat energy upon unloading. This washing machine isolator pad prevents the vibration of the washing machine from transmitting into the floor, effectively reducing the overall noise and vibration the machine can transmit into the home, as well as reducing the forces and stresses in the machine. Another type of damping is frictional damping or Coulomb damping. This type of damping arises from the energy lost in the sliding of parts in contact. As the parts move, the total energy decreases through the frictional loss and is dissipated into heat and noise. Here we can clearly see how friction between parts is being converted into heat as this drill cuts into the metal. So a less extreme example is that of a pendulum. A pendulum is designed to have a very low friction and continue to oscillate with minimal loss in energy. But what if the friction of the pivot is not negligible? Typically, the pivot will be designed to minimize the frictional loss. 
But in this case, we illustrate what happens when there is appreciable friction at the pivot. We see the energy alternates between potential and kinetic energy as expected, and that the total energy, sum of the potential and kinetic, decreases over time. We also see how the amplitude of the pendulum displacement decreases over time. Now that we have covered the type of physical damping, let's shift gears to discuss how to characterize damping. Depending on the industry, the type of vibration, free or forced, the type of material, or even the type of testing performed, we will find there are different ways to characterize damping. We will cover the most popular ways and also discuss which to choose depending on the situation. A very common way to characterize damping is through the damping ratio. The damping ratio is the ratio of the actual damping to the critical damping. Lower values specify less damping, and large values specify more damping. The critical damping is the damping that is required for the system response to change from oscillatory to non-oscillatory. To illustrate this concept, let's take a simple spring mass damper system. Pull on the mass and let go. Notice how the mass oscillates, but the vibration is quickly damped out. If we vary the amount of damping and plot the motion of the mass, we will end up with several types of behavior. With the damping ratio of zero, the behavior would be oscillatory with no decay in amplitude. If the damping ratio is between zero and one, the case is called underdamped and the behavior is oscillatory with the decay in the amplitude as shown by the orange curve. As the damping ratio gets larger but still less than one, the amplitude decays quickly. When the damping ratio is equal to one, we have a special case called critical damping. It is at this point that the behavior of the system changes and is no longer oscillatory as shown by the blue line. And the system gets to equilibrium, which is steady state the quickest. Finally, we have the case where the damping ratio is greater than one, which is overdamped. And again, we see the non-oscillatory behavior and increasing the damping ratio increases the time it takes for the system to reach equilibrium. So what is the value to specify for the damping ratio for your simulation? In general, most engineering metals will have a damping ratio below 0.05 or 5%, with the majority typically closer to or less than 0.02 or 2%. But for some elastomeric materials such as rubbers, the ratios will generally be higher. Specifying lower values of damping ratio typically results in larger amplitudes, deformations, and stresses, so lower is conservative, and when in doubt, specifying less damping will generally be a recommendation. We will cover how to measure the damping ratio shortly. Also, the damping ratio is specified in linear dynamic simulations that use the mode superposition method, which we will discuss in the future section. Okay, so we saw how different levels of damping can affect the free response of structure. But what if the structure was experiencing a forced, steady, sinusoidal, think harmonic excitation? In that case, what does different levels of damping do to the response? The damping decreases the maximum amplitude of the sinusoidal response as we saw in the treadmill example. Let's further illustrate this with another example. Drones have multiple motors spinning. The motor excitation of the drone is a forced vibration problem. If one of the blades is out of balance or is perturbed, it can create a forced vibration in the drone. How much will this forced vibration cause the drone arm to displace? This depends on the magnitude of the forced vibration, the stiffness of the arm, but also the damping ratio of the system. We can see in the graph the effect the damping has on the amplitude of the vibration response. The peak curves soften with higher amounts of damping as we predict smaller amplitudes of steady state vibration. We may not know the total details of the physical phenomenon that's causing the damping in the structure, but typically we can specify equivalent values to numerically account for it. For example, a tall building following an earthquake may sway from the excitation. The natural decay in the motion of a building after a seismic event may come from the viscous motion of the building against the air, the hysteretic damping of the steel material, energy dissipated in the vibration isolator if it has one, and even the slight slippage of bolted connections. 
but knowing how much for each of these physical phenomena may not be easily determined. So then how to determine the damping of an actual structure, which we can specify to account for this effective damping? In practice, what to specify for the damping ratios is one of the most likely unknowns. References can be found and they can often be a good starting point, but there are also experimental means to calculating the damping ratios. We will cover two of the most common methods, the logarithmic decrement method and the half power bandwidth method. The logarithmic decrement method is a very common method to compute the damping ratio. If we excite the structure and then measure the successive decay in the amplitude of the vibration, we can compute the damping ratio. So what is required is some measurement of the amplitude of the structure. There are various measurement methods such as a strain gauge, an accelerometer, optical imaging, laser measurement, or even a microphone. Once we have a graph of a portion of the vibration of the decay of the displacement, we can compute the damping ratio from this. Let's again use this guitar string as an example. We pluck the string and we clearly see and hear the decay in the vibration. Then using optical measurements, we can trace the string's displacement over time. Using this time history, we will first measure the logarithmic decrement delta. We measure displacement at any given point in the vibration time history. Then we measure it again following one or more oscillations away. So if we measure the subsequent peak, then n is equal to 1. If we measure at two oscillations after the first, then n is equal to 2, and so on. Substituting these values in this equation, the logarithmic decrement is computed. It is then substituted into this equation to compute the damping ratio. This method is most commonly used when there is a single dominant frequency in free vibration problems. The other method for computing the damping ratio is called the half power bandwidth method. Now this method can work well when there are multiple frequencies and we can compute a damping ratio for the desired dominant frequencies and further improve our accuracy of the simulation model. In this example, we will use the arm of a drone with a motor mounted. The motor may be exciting a vibration in the drone arm and the maximum displacement response as a function of frequency is shown here from this forced frequency response or harmonic analysis. We're going to discuss harmonic analysis in the future section. For now, we have this frequency response plot, and we wish to extract a damping ratio from one or more of the peaks. By the way, the peaks may appear at the natural frequencies if the excitation sufficiently excites it. We can compute the damping ratio at a peak by first computing the amplification factor Q. Q gives us a measure of how undamped a system is which is the opposite of damping ratio. Large Q signifies small amounts of damping. To compute Q in this equation, we extract the natural frequency F sub n, which is the frequency where the curve has maximum amplitude A max. Then we compute the value of the amplitude that is A max over the square root of two. At this amplitude, we will find there are two intersections with the curve, and we can extract these two respective frequencies, F sub one and F sub two. Now, Q can be computed using this simple equation. Critical damping occurs at a Q factor of 0.5. Overdamped systems have Q less than 0.5, and underdamped systems have Q greater than 0.5. We can now compute the damping ratio using this equation. This can be repeated at the other peaks in the frequency response curve. By the way, what is the experimental method to generate the frequency response plot? Typically, the hammer impact test where the part is tapped and the acceleration response is measured via accelerometers, or via shaker table that vibrates the structure over a specified frequency range, and again, accelerometers measure the response. We won't get into the details of these experimental methods. Moving on to other methods to characterize damping, let's discuss the important case of the behavior of elastomeric or rubber-like materials. Elastomeric materials have damping that typically varies with frequency, so we will not have a single value over the frequency range, we will multiple. This type of damping is called viscoelastic damping. Typical applications are vibration isolation or absorption, as in the case of this treadmill we discussed earlier, or in the vibration isolation of other machinery where the elastomeric mount connects between the structure that is vibrating and the rest of the structure to reduce noise and vibration. 
So typically, a sample of the material is put into a testing machine that can compute what is called DMA, or Dynamic Mechanical Analysis. The output from this test includes the storage and the loss moduli, which vary as a function of frequency. These material properties can be provided to the simulation to account for the frequency dependency. The loss factor can also be computed from these moduli using this simple equation, and we will see shortly that it is related to other measures such as the damping ratio and the amplification factor Q. Okay, we have seen and discussed damping ratio, Q, and now the loss factor. It may seem really confusing. Different industries may prefer different measures, but the good news is they are interrelated. For low levels of damping, we can use these relationships to convert between the various measures. Now what are some typical values of damping? Here's a simple chart that can give some idea of the range, but notice there is not a single value for a given material. There are many different alloys, compositions, treatments that can change the damping, so you'll notice a large range of these loss factors reported at room temperature. For example, notice the very large range for plastics and rubbers. Keeping in mind that not only will the loss factor change with composition of the actual material, but it will be dependent on the frequency of the vibration and also the temperature, especially for non-metallic materials. A rubber isolator operating in the frigid arctic will dampen vibration differently than if operating at the steamy equator. An example could be a car tire that is cold will not absorb vibration as well as one that's warmed up. Now in the study of dynamics there are still other ways to characterize damping, and one method is called Raleigh damping. Raleigh damping is convenient mathematically because it is linear and proportional to the mass and the stiffness matrices. If we recall the general matrix form of the equation of motion, we wish to provide the damping matrix C to account for the damping of the system. We can assume that the damping matrix C is a linear sum of a real value alpha times the mass matrix plus a real value beta times the stiffness matrix. So for a given problem, the user could specify two real values, one for alpha and one for beta, this results in viscous damping that is proportional to the linear combination or sum of the mass and stiffness matrices. But the million dollar question is what to specify for alpha and beta. They are not material properties and typically they are unknown. They can be derived from testing, research, or established best practices. Now how do they relate to the damping ratio? Knowing the damping ratio at a particular frequency, they can be calculated using this equation. Then the damping ratio will vary as a function of frequency with contributions from both the mass and the stiffness multipliers as shown here. The challenge is this distribution will rarely match the necessary damping over a large frequency range. There are references on Raleigh damping that go more into this in detail, but we will briefly revisit Raleigh damping during our next section where we apply it to a sample problem. Finishing up our discussion on damping, what we have seen in our equation of motion just now, the C matrix, governs the damping of the system. In later sections, we will be focusing on dynamic simulations that use the modal results in what is called the mode superposition method. Here we will change our perspective to the frequency domain from this time domain. What we will find is that using the mode superposition method, we can specify the damping ratio on a per-mode basis which will provide greater flexibility among other advantages of solving in the frequency domain. As a preview ahead, we show here the equation for the modal coordinate which is computed for each natural frequency. This equation tells us how much each mode contributes to the overall expected amplitude of the vibration. You will notice that the damping ratio is right there in the denominator. Well, we can see that damping is a broad topic and we have covered a lot of material. In our next section, we will reinforce the learning and apply some of the lessons learned here through actual examples.